Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome. We're thrilled that you could watch this webinar with us today on behalf of Lyft, as well as Legal Hand and the Family Justice Centers, who we will be sharing more information about at the end of this webinar. Thank you for making the time in the middle of this very um, difficult period. We hope that you and your families are healthy and safe. If you are somebody who's going through family court issues right now and seeking guidance and information, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If you are a service provider, an attorney interested in pro bono, or an individual interested in family law, welcome. We expect this will be the first in a series of webinars about family law and, court, and family court in New York State. We've done our best to iron out the tech issues, but we'd appreciate your patience if we run into any issues. So we're going to get introduce ourselves and then get going. My name is Hilly Teller. I manage Lyft's uh, community outreach efforts. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Burke. I'm the Bronx staff attorney. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Natalie Gonzalez and I'm the legal director. Hi everyone, my name is Marina Rio and I'm a bilingual program associate. Great. We're gonna be sharing more information about Lyft at the end of this webinar, but if you have any questions about something that we're talking about today, please know that we have a helpline. The helpline number is here on this slide. Uh, we have a phone helpline as well as a live chat and an email helpline through our website. Please don't hesitate to reach out and give us a call. Um, you can talk with our team live. Okay, so today we're gonna start off with some information about family court and the COVID-19 public health crisis. Um, then Molly's gonna talk with us about paternity and child support in New York State. Natalie is gonna share information with us about custody and visitation. And then we're gonna wrap up with information about orders of protection and where to go for help and resources. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Hilly said, we'll be starting this off with just an overview of what's going on in family court and how COVID-19 has impacted family court. Um, just to let you guys know, um, as of today's date, May 5th, this is the information that we know, but as you should all know, it is likely to change. It could change tomorrow, it could change next week. So what we advise for everyone to do is contact us and we are happy to update you on any information, on any changes that may have happened since this webinar took place. So what's going on in the family courts? So as of today's date, the family courts are all closed for the public, meaning that you cannot walk, go into a family court and access the same services you would have a couple of months ago. They're operating virtually. Um, and all, I guess it says, all the public, all the buildings are physically co closed. Um, all of the hearings that are being held, and we'll talk a little more about what those hearings are, are being held through virtual courtrooms, meaning that they're being held through phone and video, again, and no personal appearances. If you had a court date that was scheduled during these times, then that court date has likely been moved to a later court date. Uh, you can, you will be receiving notices, hopefully, through the mail or by email from the courts that give you another court date or inform you of this, that your court date has been moved. Unfortunately, as you all know, this really happened overnight and the courts are doing their best, along with the rest of us, to catch up and keep everyone abreast of what's going on. So aside from that, what kind of cases are being heard? So any new filings that are not emergencies are not being accepted at this time. What are emergencies? And we'll talk a little bit about this next slide. Okay. So emergency matters at this time are considered cases of abuse, neglect, juvenile delinquency, orders of protection, and cases of custody and visitation only in emergency situations. What does an emergency situation amount to? Every case is case by case. So the best thing we can advise is for you to reach out to Lyft, uh, speak out to our helpline, or schedule an appointment to speak to one of our attorneys that can review the case with you and talk about the best remedies at this time. Molly and I will go a little more in depth about filing 
child support, custody visitation matters, and some of the issues that are being faced at this time. However, as we said, emergency matters only at this moment in time. And again, Lyft is here to help. Whether we can provide you updated information, provide you resources, referrals, have you speak to one of our attorneys so that when the court can hear your case, you are prepared and ready to go. We're, we're happy to do whatever we can. So please reach out to us. Don't hesitate. Um, and we are, we're here to help as our, our partners and everyone else in this. Next slide. Any questions? Let's see. Um, so far, no questions. Okay, not a problem. As we showed in the previous slides and also on the bottom right of all of our slides, our helpline number and our website are there. So please, if questions do come up, do not hesitate in reaching out to us. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Molly. All right, thank you so much for that, Natalie. Um, thank you everyone for coming and watching our webinar. I, we are doing an overview of family law and I do wanna remind everyone that everything is very case specific and it, it depends, it can go case by case. So reach out to us if you have any questions. I'll be discussing paternity and an overview of child support before and taking some questions on that before handle, handing it back over to Natalie for custody and visitation. Next slide. So first, what is paternity? Paternity is the legal status of being a father. It's establishing paternity means determining or proving who the legal father of the child or children are. And it's so important to establish paternity because it has to be established before any child support, custody, or visitation case is heard. Once it's established, the two parents have equal rights to their child. But if paternity hasn't been established, then an individual may not have the same rights as the children's mother. Next slide. Who may file for paternity? The biological mother, the alleged biological father, the Department of Social Services for a parent or guardian who lists the child on a public assistance case. Public assistance, I'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to child support. Um, the child can also file for paternity and the child's guardian can file. Generally, support magistrates decide or hear paternity cases unless there's an issue of equitable estoppel apple in which case only a judge can hear the case or decide the case next slide so how do you establish paternity the first way is through marriage and the presumption of legitimacy whoever is married to the mother of the child at the time of the child's birth will automatically be considered the legal father of the child this is known as the presumption of legitimacy in this case paternity does not have to be established in court the second way that paternity can be established is through an acknowledgement of paternity. Whoever signs this acknowledgement of paternity or AOP after the child is born will be considered the legal father. This is a form that's filled out by both parents stating that the individual filling out the form is the father of the child. It's often signed in the hospital with the birth certificate, but the birth certificate and the acknowledgement of paternity are two separate legal documents. A common misconception is that the birth certificate, not the AOP, automatically establishes paternity, not the case. The birth certificate must be paired with the AOP, the marriage certificate, or a court order affiliation in order to establish paternity in court. The third way I mentioned was a court order affiliation. This is an order entered by the support magistrate when either the parties can consent or agree that the alleged father is the parent of the child, or it can be after a genetic marker test that's ordered by the court. The genetic marker test has to be ordered by the court. An at-home DNA test from, from an at-home pharmacy like Walgreens, anything like that, will not be admissible in court. There's also something known as equitable estoppel. This is something that can prevent someone from challenging paternity. This often happens when someone has held themselves out or acted as a child's father. In this case, 
the court is concerned with what's in the best interest of the child. The court is really reluctant to remove someone who has acted as a father from the child's life. Next slide. Let's get into child support. Next slide. What is child support? It's the financial support provided by the non-custodial parent or the person who does not physically live with the child most of the time to cover general expenses like food, shelter, and clothing for the child. It also includes expenses for health insurance, health care, and child care. Next slide. How long does child support last? In New York State, child support lasts until the child is 21 years old unless there's an emancipating event, such as if the child joins the military, but even then can be very case specific. Um, how a common question that people often ask is, can I get a lawyer to represent me for my child support case? Generally, there are no court appointed attorneys for child support cases, unless you're the respondent in a child support violation case and you're facing the possibility of incarceration. Another common question is, is the court going to decide custody and visitation with at the same time as my child support case? No, these are completely separate cases heard by separate jurists. One does not affect the other. And as promised, I said we would talk about child support and public assistance. When a child is receiving public assistance, the Department of Social Services will automatically start a child support case against the non-custodial parent. Department of Social Services are, or DSS are the ones who are receiving the payments, not the custodial caregiver, the person who lives with the child most of the time. The custodial caregiver can, however, receive a pass-through if there are no arrears and if the child support amount is greater than the Department of Social Services budget letter. There can only be one child support case per child, so the custodial caregiver cannot also file for child support if DSS has already filed. There's no double dipping. There's, if there's any concerns with domestic violence or intimate partner violence, address these concerns with your caseworker when you're applying for any benefits. Next slide. So how do you calculate child support? The court generally tries to base child support on a person's actual income, but this can only happen when, one, the parties appear, they show up to court on time, and they're seen by the support magistrate, and two, the parties provide credible or believable evidence about their income. If you don't appear as a respondent, then as the person who the case is against, then the court can enter an order without you. This is often known as a default order. In this case, the court can impute or assign income to you, and the child support order may be much higher than it would be based on your actual income. Credible evidence or believable evidence about your income can include the financial disclosure affidavit that's signed and notarized. This comes with the summons and petition you receive when you're summoned to go to court for child support your W-2s and tax returns, job search diary, odd jobs diary. If there's no credible or not enough credible evidence brought, the court, this is another place that the court can impute or assign income to you as well. Look in the summons and petition for a list of documents that you should be bringing with you. Child support can be broken down into two parts. There's the basic obligation to cover the basic basic needs of the child, like food, clothing, shelter, other necessities, and there's add-ons for unreimbursed medical expenses, child care, and educational costs. It should be noted that child support is retroactive back to either the day the custodial caregiver files a petition for child support or when the child goes on public assistance. It does not go back to the child's birth. So if I were to file a child support case against my partner today, May 5th, but a, a court order was not entered until November 5th, then from May 5th until November 5th, my partner could be, could be liable for, for paying child support during the time period between May and November. Next slide. 
This is what the court uses to calculate child support. It's based off of statute or law. Um, so if I have one child, then the percentage applied to my AGI or adjusted gross income is going to be 17%. Next slide. I've been speaking a lot about arrears. Arrears are unpaid child support. It's very difficult to change arrears once they're in place. If you owe arrears to the custodial caregiver, then only they can forgive those arrears. If the child is receiving public assistance, however, the arrears are owed to DSS. Contact OCSS to talk about your case and see if you qualify for any of their arrears reduction programs. They often have many programs available to, to try to lower those arrears. Because it's so difficult to modify arrears, it's very, very, very important to file a modification petition as soon as there's been a substantial change in circumstances, which I will get to on next slide. So a modification petition, it's a petition that essentially asks the court to change a final child support order. It has to be a final order. Um, it cannot be during, during a proceeding, only when there are no proceedings left. To file for a modification petition, you must prove that there's been a substantial change in circumstances. Those are all listed. Some of them are listed here. This could be a child moving in with a different adult, an emancipation event, such as the child joins the military, they get married, and there's more than one child on the budget letter, and the older child turns 21. Um, you're facing incarceration, there's been a change of employment, something like that. The court can generally only modify back to the date that the petition was filed. One thing that is very common when filing modifications is the loss of employment. Losing a job does not mean that the court will automatically modify the child support order. When the when considering whether to modify a court order, the court's going to want to know the reason that the job was lost. For example, they generally look to see was it foreseeable or was it unforeseeable? Something foreseeable would be that you've lost your job due to your own actions. The most common things are you've quit or you've done something to get yourself fired. In this case, the court's unlikely to change a final court order. An unforeseeable circumstance, however, are changes that happen through no fault of your own. The court may be more amenable to this. Next slide. So what's going on with child support and the courts? Remember, this is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, right now, the New York City family courts are not currently hearing child support cases. New challenges come along with this. Some parents have been laid off or have had their, their, their hours reduced and they can no longer pay their child support at the same level. And some parents are no longer receiving the child support that they, they're depending upon. So when the courts reopen or when they start hearing child support cases, what are some examples of what I can show the magistrate? This is very case specific. To get individualized information, contact us. This, these are examples of what you could possibly show. It could be a letter from your employer or former employer about your employment status or why you've lost your job if you have, proof of any unemployment benefits, any receipts of payments that have been made, even if it's not for the full amount, and a list of all missed payments and the total amount that's owed to date. Another thing could be a job search diary or an odd jobs diary. Okay, next slide. Okay, any questions? Um, Molly, we have a couple of questions for you. Awesome. Ready? I'm ready. All right. I lost my job due to COVID-19 in March. When will I be able to apply for a downward modification of child support? Again, so like we said in the last slide, child support cases are currently not being heard as of May 5th. This may change. Contact either Lyft or the courts for any updated information about this. Great. 
if the other parent isn't letting me see my child, do I still have to pay for child support? So remember when I said that custody and visitation and child support are completely separate cases? These are completely separate cases. Um, even though you're paying child support, you, you're you not necessarily entitled to have visitation and, and vice versa. Natalie's going to get into the specifics of custody and visitation and maybe how you can file for a petition for visitation to be able to see your children. Awesome, perfect. So for already pending child support matters, if a child support case was able to settle during the duration of the pandemic, is there any way to push those settlements before a magistrate in order to finalize it and get it signed off on? Not that I know of. Um, child support cases are not currently being heard. A, a magistrate may be able to, to reach out, but no, unfortunately, not until until we have updated information. Yeah, I mean, you can try to see if, if the stipulation is already drafted up, um, if it could be submitted, uh, and it's really up to the, um, it's really up to the, 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 the borough that's entertaining the, the case, the stipulation, if they're going to entertain it or not. Um, so feel free to give us a call for more information on that question. All right, last but not least, what if the non-custodial parent works off the books and does not bring evidence of income? There's always ways around this. Um, getting a letter from their employer, um, subpoenas can work to, to subpoena their bank account or maybe their employer, um, contact us. We've got more tricks up our sleeves, but it can, it depends on the case. I hate to say that, but it depends on the case and we may be able to, to help you with more of the specifics. Hey, thank you, Molly. Absolutely. I'm going to hand it back over to you. Great. All right, next slide. Let's talk about custody and visitation, um, the other side of rights and responsibilities once paternity is established. Next slide. Okay, so what is custody? Definition of custody is custody is a right to parent your child. There are two different aspects of custody that fall under the custody umbrella. One is physical custody, and that means where the child lives and the other is legal custody, and that is the ability to make decisions that impact the child's life. Think about decisions that involve religion, medical, educational, usually big decisions that have to be made regarding the child. So what are the different types of custody? We, we, I know it gets thrown around, shared, joint, soul. So let's talk a little bit about what each of these mean. So Molly talked about establishing paternity. Once that's established, that lays the foundation for rights and responsibilities. Once paternity is established, then we're assuming that when it comes to custody, parties are sharing in custody, meaning that both physical and legal custody are shared between both parents. It might very well be the case that that's not your day-to-day -day with your family, but remember, until there is a court order that says otherwise, it's assumed that parties share in custody. That is the default setting. So if you're gonna file in court to try to establish something a little more specific, then one thing that you can ask for is joint custody. Joint custody will allow both parents to share in either the physical custody, the legal custody, or both. Sharing in physical custody is a little complicated. As you can imagine, you're splitting the child's time 50-50 which is great if parties can co-parent very well together, but something that the court wants you to think about is logistics. Once a child gets older, where they're gonna go to school, where both parents live, if they live close enough to each other that they'll be able to take the child to school and the child will stay in that one school and the child's activities, friends, etc. cetera. Um, and also co-parenting. So if one parent is willing to do that, and the other not so much to the extent of being able to share the child physically 50 50 the court's not going to order joint physical custody joint legal is a little different and many time parents can ask for joint legal custody meaning parties will have to have a conversation when it comes to making those big decisions over that child's life both parties will always have to be informed 
of what's going on in the child's life. However, um, they have to not only inform themselves, but also come to a decision together. That is what joint legal custody basically entails. Now, sometimes parents say, well, that's not something that can work out for our family. So what are my other options? Well, many times parents can ask for sole custody. They can ask for sole physical and legal custody. That means that one parent it has the child the majority of the time, but they also have the decision-making power over that child. Does not mean that the rights of the other parent are terminated. Does not not mean that the other parent has is kept out of the loop of everything that's going on in the child's life. It just means that the final say will be with that parent, with the one parent that has sole legal custody. So many times the common scenario that you see is that parents might share a joint legal custody and one parent will have sole physical custody, allowing the other parent to have parenting time. And we'll talk a little bit more about parenting time and visitation. Next slide. Last but not least, you have, oh sorry, previous slide, sorry, should have thrown in next slide in there. Um, last but not least, you have something called split custody. And split custody has to do with zones of decision making. So let me give you an example, right? Let's say we have um, Mark and Mandy, and Mark is a doctor, Mandy is a teacher. They both are very involved in their children's lives. They both are active in their children's lives. Both great parents, there's no argument there. Unfortunately, they can't make decisions together. So what can you do when both parents have a right to make decisions together, they're both involved, it would be in the child's best interest, however, they just can't. Well, there's an option of split custody and that's zones of decision making. So if one parent is a doctor, they can easily make the argument that they would prefer to make medical decisions and have the final say on that. And if the other parent is an educator or has more experience in that or for example, cares more about religion than the other parent and it's more important to them, then they can say, fine, you can make medical decisions, I will make religious decisions or educational decisions. So what I will say to you now and for you to keep in mind and carry throughout this, um, this webinar and this presentation is that custody and visitation is really you can mold it to what your family needs. Not, no two families are the same. So if there are certain needs that your family has to address and there are certain things that you'd like to see in that custody and visitation order, they definitely can be addressed and molded to the needs of your family. Next slide. So we talked about parenting time visitation. Visitation is that parenting time between the non-custodial parent and their child. Now again, Types of visitations, they're all listed there. Make it what is necessary for your family. Also include certain provisions that may be necessary in your case. Something very important to keep in mind is if there is a history of domestic violence, then the court can make certain considerations um, for drop-offs and pickups, for example. Those can happen in public spaces, they can happen at the precinct. If sometimes abusers will use email, I mean, we'll use just general communication uh, to harass the other party, then you can ask the court to limit communications to email or even limit the amount of times that the parent is calling the child. You can call the child every day, but we can add a provision that says between five and six or between four and six, the parent can call the child. That way, if the parent is calling the other parent at midnight with the excuse that they're looking to speak to the child, Technically, that's really just an excuse they're using. They might be using that as a form of harassment. So if you have this address in your order, then they'd be violating the order. And it also would be protecting you if you decide not to pick up that call. Next slide. Okay, so who can file for custody and visitation? When you hear the word standing, that basically means who has the right under law to file. So for visitation, 
the law states that it can only be parents and grandparents and siblings. However, if grandparents and siblings are filing, then there are certain additional criteria that they have to meet. For example, there has to be a reason why those visits aren't happening through the parents. One always assumes that, let's say, when a non-custodial parent gets visitation time, that parent can take the child to visit with aunts, uncles, extended family, grandma, grandpa. So if it's not happening in the course of regular visitation, why is it not happening? The court will definitely want to ask that question. And then they want to make sure that there's an established relationship that you know, child and grandparents and child and siblings have actually visited in the past and have some form of relationship. And last but not least, something that is always factored into any custody visitation decision that is the basis of custody visitation decisions, if it's in the child's best interest. And in the coming slides, we will talk more about this, um, but also specifics that go into deciding what's in the child's best interest. So for custody, it's just slightly a little different. For custody, it's the legal parent that can file, but it's also anyone else, as long as they're a caretaker. It doesn't have to be a grandparent, doesn't even have to be a blood relative. However, again, the extra burden they have to meet. If it's a non-parent caretaker, they have to demonstrate their extraordinary circumstances, and it would be in the child's best interest. So for example, let's say dad, and his mom raised dad's child, right? Paternal grandmother helped raise her son's child. Mom's been out of the picture since birth. The child is now seven, eight years old. Grandma helps cook, you know, clean, um, taking the child to the doctor, anything to think of. Grandma's also like a caretaker, great. Unfortunately, dad passes away. Grandma has standing to file for custody. And if mom shows up in the picture, she can still file for custody. And her argument would be, look, the extraordinary circumstances are, unfortunately, my son passed away. And also, this child is nine, 10 years old. I've been there since day one. The child knows me. There's a routine. There's stability established. It would be best for the child to be with me. Next slide. OK. So just a couple of questions about custody and visitation. Where can my custody and visitation case be filed? So you want to file your custody and visitation case where the child has lived for the past six months. If the child happens to be younger than six months of age, then you'll file where the child has primarily lived. What about getting an attorney for my child for my custody and visitation case? Generally, where financially eligible, you do have a right to ask the court to appoint which means give you a free attorney. Something else to keep in mind is that the court has the discretion to appoint an AFC, which is an attorney for the child. An attorney for the child represents your child. They meet outside of court and just basically have age appropriate conversations of what's happening, of what their, their day to day is like, and that can sometimes confirm what the parties are saying. Um, but more or less, they also want to get an idea of how the child feels about it. Obviously, a two-year-old is not going to be able to convey that, but someone who's 11 or 12 may say, look, I love hanging out with both my parents. I'm okay with increasing visitation with a non-custodial parent, or I'd like to cut down on it. Whatever the case may be, the desires for the child do play a part, especially as the child gets older. Next slide. Okay. So a couple of other things to discuss. Relocation. So relocation is basically a parent picking up and moving to another state or another part of the state, another country. The custodial parent should get the permission of either the non-custodial parent or the court before making that move. If the non-custodial parent disagrees with the move, they can still file in court. The court will, again, remember best interest, it always comes back to that. They will look at the child's best interest and then they will also have a balancing test. Why is this move happening? 
will the child still have a meaningful relationship with the non-custodial parent? Custodial parents moving to California from New York, unless you're rich, it's going to be hard to get those bi-weekly visits in. Um, so parents have to be willing to maintain that relationship. Um, and just so you know, I mean, parent can pick up and relocate without a court order or without the other parent's permission. However, keep in mind, if that happens, the other parent, meaning the non-custodial parent, has six months to bring them to court in New York. And the court can easily order that parent to return, the, order the custodial parent to return the child to New York. So that is something that, to keep in mind, can easily happen because New York will retain jurisdiction, meaning the authority to hear a case um, over that child for six months. Okay, so what about changing orders of custody and visitation? Can absolutely happen. However, when filing to modify, you would have to demonstrate that there's been substantial change of circumstances and it's in the best interest of the child. And what about enforcing orders of custody and visitation? Well, that would involve filing a violation petition. A violation petition can also be the basis for modifying the order. So something to keep in mind is that if you file a violation petition because the custodial parent isn't allowing you to visit, the court is not gonna monitor that. They're not gonna show up at your next visit and make sure that they're following the order. So if this continues, what you can do is make sure you have a remedy in mind and request that to court. That remedy can be asking for more visitation time or asking for a change of hours, for example. So when we meet with clients, we try to get creative of what the ask can be. Something to also keep in mind is that if you're the custodial parent filing an enforcement, unfortunately the court can't make, cannot make a non-custodial parent visit with the child. So the ask or the best remedy you might get is that time gets cut down, um, relocation gets approved if that's on the table, but again, it's always important to talk to us or consult with an attorney to talk about the specifics of your case. Next slide. Okay, now we got to the best part that I promised. Um, best interest of the child. What is that? So when the, when the court is looking at what's in the best interest of the child, there are different things that they can take into consideration and that they're going to look at. They're going to make a decision based on the totality of the circumstances. And some of the things that they will look at is the stability and continuity of the child, which one of the parents can provide that, who has been the primary caretaker, the quality of the home environment, who's been able to provide or will be able to provide the emotional and for the emotional and intellectual development of the child, the fitness of the parent, if there are ongoing issues of mental health or substance abuse issues, those can be raised. And as I said before, the desires of the child. Again, case-by-case case basis. So if there's something that you feel the court should know about and is relevant to your family, then you can definitely raise that. Next slide. Okay, my turn to talk about COVID and visitation. So again, as of today's day, May 5th, 2020, what is happening is that a lot of parents are looking for answers on how to handle visitation and custody orders. Visitation and custody orders are still in effect. However, there are understandable concerns about children going outside. And if the stay at home order means that parents can withhold visitation. Again, orders are still in effect. However, unfortunately, however and unfortunately, the courts are not hearing any kind of modification or violation cases at this time. So obtaining relief from the court is something that is not happening currently for these kinds of cases. However, please reach out to us and we're happy to update you on any changes. Um, but things that we tell folks to keep in mind is that when the courts are up and running, they're going to want to see the efforts the parents took to come up with some kind of temporary visitation solution. So maybe that involves more time with, um, maybe that involves more time 
FaceTiming. Maybe that involves more time on the phone with a child. Uh, maybe that involves making up that time in the future. It's really about getting creative and trying to co-parent during the situation. Um, so we're constantly encouraging that and constantly referring out to mediation services as well because it's really a time to try to work together. And again, as of today's day, but things can change a week from now, a month from now. So please don't hesitate in reaching out to us. Next slide. Questions. Hi, Natalie. Hello, Molly. Hello again. Hello. Thanks for that. All right. Fair, fair. My turn to ask you some questions. Awesome. So with a court-ordered visitation, is a co-parent required to have a child tra travel out of state to co-parent during the pandemic? It depends. Again, custody and visitation orders remain in effect. However, every situation is different and there are different considerations to be taken at this time. Um, the best that we would suggest is to see if there is a way, if there are concerns, safety concerns, if there is a way to communicate with the other parent and come up with alternative solutions. Um, so again, Please contact us. We'd be happy to go into more details about that specific case and any others. Um, but it really depends. And I hate that that's always my answer. But It does, though. Um, okay, second question. Can a child's aunt or uncle file for custody if they live out of state? Well, again, contact us because there's a lot of follow-up questions I have to that. Um, do they have the child in their care? Uh, you know, why are, anyone can file, of course, but it's whether or not the court will entertain the case, whether or not you have a strong enough case. And we'd be happy to, to talk about what the court can do, all of these things that we talked about, um, and help build a case or at least let you know if there is a case to be had yeah. in your situation. Definitely. Um, how is the six months time limit affected by the courts currently being closed? Does the clock still run or has it been paused? That's a good question. Um, so there, I mean, there has been a pause statewide for things like statute of limitations and filings, et cetera. Um, there hasn't been clear communication what that looks like in terms of the six month rule. Um, we are hoping that the court will obviously take into consideration and again, look at the whole picture of what happened. Um, if there was any ill will or any malicious intent when with when they decided to move and take advantage of the situation so it really again my my third it depends of of the evening That's three for three okay four for four let's go let's do it all right my daughter doesn't want to go visit her dad will i get in trouble for not forcing her to go let me uh -huh. hear it it depends. <laughs> um, so the court is really going to encourage you as a custodial parent to really push the child. Um, obviously, you, you can't threaten them, um, but things like, you know, taking away phone privileges, video game time. I don't even know how parents are punishing kids nowadays. Um, but that's that's acceptable right because if you have a rebellious teenager i mean things are tough but if your teenager says i'm not going to go to school like you can't just shrug it off and call it a day so the court is going to want to see that you've made every effort possible um obviously that you haven't bad mouthed the other parent so that the child feels this way um but again they're going to want to see those efforts that you've you've pushed for that you've tried to make the child visit, try to speak to the other parent about it. Um, totality of the circumstances. Yeah. yeah. All right. Is that all you got for me? That's all I got for you. All right. Well, I believe it's your turn again. I believe it is. All right. Good luck. Let's talk about orders of protection and family offense petitions. Next slide. Something I really want to highlight with family offense petitions is the differences between a family offense petition in family court and trying to get an order of protection in criminal court. Whereas in, in criminal court, there must be a criminal case.
the prosecutor or the assistant district attorney, the ADA, is usually the one bringing the case to the judge, and this is usually after an arrest is made. The person receiving the order of protection does not need to have any special relationship with the person the order is against. However, for a family court, there is a special relationship requirement. You have to be related by blood or marriage, be married or have been married in the past, have a child in common, or be in or have been in an intimate relationship. So I could file for an order of protection in family court against my partner, but I, and I could also file in criminal court, but I could not necessarily file an, an order of protection in family court against a coworker that I don't have that intimate relationship with, whereas I could file in criminal court. Next slide. Family offenses and current court updates. So existing orders of protection right now, an administrative order from March 19th and March 22nd have extended all orders of protection that were in effect before this ongoing health crisis. Both criminal and family court orders of protection have been automatically extended and they're still active until the case can be calendared for after the COVID-19 health crisis. To file new orders of protection, family offense cases are still being heard in family court. This is one, one of those essential matters that Natalie was talking about earlier. Contact the FJC or Safe Horizon if you're considering or need to file an order of protection. All of these numbers are listed on the purple on the left. Okay, next slide. Questions? I'm back. You're back. Okay. All right. We have two questions for you. Okay. What is the process for a client to request, obtain, and serve an order of protection against a partner they are living with at this time? For request, contact the FJC Horizon Sanctuary for Families, one of those numbers listed on the previous slide. Um, actually, can we go back to that previous slide really quick? Yeah, just so those numbers are there. Um, contact them. If you're living with a possible abusive partner, um, the court is reluctant to, to place anyone outside of their homes right now with everything going on. However, that doesn't mean that they're not going to. Right. And our last question of the evening, are there fewer family offense petitions being filed, being issued due to the stay at home order? Being issued? Um, it's hard to know if they're being issued, yeah. but let's say filed. Probably, I think so. But again, it's... <laughs> We're not the courts. We're not going to be able to tell who's filed. But from what we've heard, there's actually been an uptick um, on order on people filing for orders of protection. Um, but again, we're not because we're not the court. We're not monitoring the specifics, yeah. let alone how many of those actually get granted. So, yeah. All right, we did it. Oh. Contact okay, <laughs> now it's Hilly's turn. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, so some information on where to go for help. Um, the Family Justice Center, as Molly was just talking about, are a great resource. Uh, if you are in need of any services, if you are a survivor or a victim of domestic or gender-based violence, the Family Justice Centers are placed throughout New York City, um, and they're, they are still operating. Even though, um, even during the COVID-19 crisis, although their physical offices are closed, they are taking live calls, they are returning all of their voicemails, um, and they also have interpreters available for clients calling in languages other than English and Spanish. All of their services are free, and everyone is welcome to reach out to the Family Justice Center. Um, language, income, gender identity, immigration status, none of these are barriers. All are welcome. Um, if you are in need of help during the weekends or the evenings when the Family Justice Center is closed, 
you can contact New York City's 24-hour domestic violence hotline. The number is here on the slide at the bottom. <clears throat> um, you could also visit uh, NYC HOPE, which is the FJC's resource directory online, and the website is linked here at the bottom. A couple other important notes about the Family Justice Centers. No, none of their databases feed into any external systems. So this includes the district attorney's offices, any internal or external law enforcement, including ICE, they don't have access to the Family Justice Center's database. This is in order to protect the confidentiality of anybody that goes to the Family Justice Center. Um, also, although their physical offices are closed right now, ICE is not uh, permitted to enter the FJC offices. So if you're concerned about that, please know that the Family Justice Center is a confidential and safe place. A couple other notes, the Family Justice Centers can also uh, help with access HRA services. The staff can overview access HRA with clients and connect clients to programs and walk them through the online application process. Um, and they also can support individuals with getting access to shelter. Although one note about that, um, the housing and shelter assistance is structured around the existing systems and resources in the city. So there aren't shelter beds that are reserved specifically for Family Justice Center clients. Instead, um, they can support you uh, in, in applying or navigating that process. They can provide hotline information. Um, they can overview housing programs and vouchers and advocate um, on your behalf to the city, all of that. But they cannot guarantee a DV shelter placement. So the Family Justice Center is a great resource. Please reach out to them if you have any questions or are, in interest, are interested in getting services and help. Um, another resource that we want to highlight is Legal Hand. Legal Hand is a program of the Center for Court Innovation. Um, they are based all around New York City. They are uh, storefronts. Anybody can walk in to receive free legal information and assistance. Um, they are still operating during COVID-19, similar to the Family Justice Centers. They're taking calls, and they also accept requests for information by email. So please reach out to them if you have any questions or concerns about any legal issues related to housing, family, immigration, divorce, domestic violence, or benefits, um, they are here to help. And you don't have to contact the office that's where you live. Um, for example, if you live in Staten Island, you can still contact the Family Justice Center. We just suggest that you reach out to the one, uh, sorry, I misspoke, you can still contact Legal Hand. Um, even, even though uh, we just recommend that you contact contact the legal hand office that's closest to where you live so that when they do reopen, if you want to go in person, you'll already have that relationship established. A couple examples of things legal hand can help with include, they can help you understand your housing rights, um, especially on issues regarding rent, repairs, or lease and eviction. They can also support you in applying for affordable housing, um, helping you know your rights when applying for a job. If you have any past uh, criminal justice involvement or history of incarceration, they can help you know your rights when applying for a job. Um, finding out how to check and improve your credit, applying for and addressing issues with public benefits, and they can also help uh, Making a, making a complaint to a city agency. So if you have any concerns or issues, reach out to Legal Hand. Um, they're a great resource and we partner with them regularly, just like we do with the Family Justice Centers. Okay, and last is Lyft. So we are here to help. If you have any questions about any of the uh, information that we covered in this webinar, please call us, email us, or chat with us. Um, we are available. As you know, we offer completely free family law information and guidance to anybody who has questions about family law and family court. We also can provide legal advice on cases of child support, custody, and visitation matters. A legal advice appointment would be just for an hour. You can sit down with one of our attorneys or, or speak with them over the phone because we're all remote right now. Um, and anybody is eligible for this. The only requirements are that you have to have a New York State case of child support, custody, or visitation, and you cannot already have an attorney. As long as that's the case, um, give us a call. If you're interested in this, we will talk with you. Our helpline team is amazing. Um, Marina's on the webinar with us right now. She works on our helpline. Um, so our helpline number is listed on this slide. You can also access additional resources and information on our website. Um, please reach out to us if you have any concerns or and also to hear updates about what's going on with the family courts. 
Thank you so much for attending this webinar and for watching with us. We hope the information was helpful for you. And please reach out if you have any additional questions or concerns. We are here to support you. Um, so thank you again, and we wish you all um, a good rest of your day. And please stay safe and healthy. Take care, everyone.